Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. You are listening to the Human Experience Podcast. My name is Xavier Katana. We've got such an amazing show for you guys today. A lot of preparation behind this show. My guest today is Mr. Graham Hancock. He is the investigative author of a number of best-selling books that look at a range of talk topics from the Ark of the Covenant to the very origins of civilization. Graham, it's a pleasure, pleasure to welcome, welcome you back to HXP, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Nice to be with you, Xavier. Nice to be back. So, so Graham... I mean, you've got this new book here. I, we're definitely going to get into that. But first, before we do that, I want to talk about some of the, the health issues that you've been going through. Mm-hmm. You were in the hospital for a little bit, right? Yeah, well, okay. So the new, the, whilst researching the new book, uh, which is called America Before, I was traveling all over North America and um, with my wife, Santa, who's a photographer, and, and she and I had a particularly arduous trip in the Southwest in Arizona and New Mexico in May 2017, uh, getting baked uh, every day in the sun out, out looking at those extraordinary ancient sites in the Southwest. Um, and uh, one night during during May in New Mexico, I kind of felt unwell when I went to bed late at night. And then I, what I remember is waking up during the night thinking I was going to throw up, going to the bathroom. And then that's the last thing I remember. And then the next information comes from my wife, Santa, who finds me writhing on the floor. Out, she notices I'm missing from the bed. She finds me writh- writhing on the floor between the bathroom and the hallway, unconscious, blood pouring from my mouth. Hmm. Quite a dramatic scene. She turns my head on the side so I don't choke on my own blood, and then calls the um, calls the calls. Is it nine nine one one? Yes. Ambulance service and and um, the paramedics come, and I'm I'm rushed to I'm rushed to hospital uh, about twenty miles away from where we were staying, and I don't remember any of this. About about twenty four hours later, I come back to I come back to consciousness. Um, and, uh, nobody really understands what's happened to me. Uh, uh, initially the diagnosis actually that I was given was, was wrong, but understandable. They discovered that I have a a condition called atrial fibrillation, which is an, an, an irregular beat of the heart that can cause strokes. And, and the initial conclusion was that I'd had some sort of mini stroke, um, this was not the case, in fact. What I'd had was an epileptic seizure, and this became much clearer two months or three months later in England in August 2017, when again the same precursors, feeling slightly nauseous, uh, occurred. And then suddenly I, I had a truly massive series of seizures which were completely unstoppable. It took two ambulance crews to get me into the ambulance. Again, I don't remember. Apparently, I was roaring and shouting. The ambulance was bouncing from side to side with me inside it. I was writhing in in, in a state of constant convulsion. They take me to the hospital. The convulsions get worse. They try all kinds of interventions. They can't reduce the convulsions. Santa's taken aside by the medics and told, look, this is really bad news. We think you're going to lose your husband. He's he's almost certainly going to die. If he lives, he's going to be severely brain damaged. Hmm. Convulsions go on. Finally, they put me into a an induced coma. They they put a ventilator down my throat. Again, I remember nothing of this. They put a ventilator down my throat, put me into a deep induced coma, uh, total blackness, just no no memory of it, just darkness. And um, 48 hours later, they bring me out of the coma, and I don't know where the hell I am. And I, I wake up in hospital. I've still got the ventilator down my throat. I think, what the fuck is this? You know, I don't understand. I feel like I've been violated. I look around. I see, I see my child, two of my children who've who, who've traveled all the way from America 
you know, my son, Sean, who, who lives in Los Angeles, my, my daughter, Shanti, who was then living in New York, they're by my bedside. I, mm. I can't understand why my other kids are there. The ones who live in the UK are there as well. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a complete mystery to me what's, what's going on. And then gradually the fog begins to clear. They take the ventilator out. I'm breathing for myself. Uh, and and the whole story is is told to me that I've had this this massive uh, set of epileptic seizures, grand mal seizures, and um, that it was a close thing. Uh, well, um, that's that's a, a an ob- object lesson for me. I, you know, I, it brings home to me how how flimsy the veil is between life and death. How we're all living on borrowed time, whether we like it or not. Um, and and uh, at any moment uh, we can we can we can leave this beautiful garden of a planet and find ourselves well who knows where that's one of the mysteries i I address in the new book is the mystery of life after death but uh it also it also said to me value this life love every minute of it appreciate every moment of it learn everything you can try to contribute in whatever way you can to making things better rather that rather than worse it was it was a profound it was a profound lesson for me Hmm. um and and i'm still at risk of seizures i did have a minor seizure this year uh knocked me out only for a few minutes and that was that was my own stupid fault because i'd stopped i'd I'd reduced my dose of anticonvulsant medication on just on a whim i felt i was taking too much of it and i reduced the dose and within three days i had another seizure so um needless to say i'm back on the meds now and uh keeping myself as fit as i can trying to avoid stress where possible although it's very difficult to avoid stress on an extremely long eight-week book tour across the united states which i'm in the middle of at the moment Mm -hmm. yes i know i mean there's only there's only one graham hancock on the planet we we can't lose you i mean you've pioneered a lot of this work that we're looking at May I add, there's only one of any of us. <laughs> it's true, but I mean, oh, and there's, you've done so much. Individuals, and we all have our we all have our part to play and our role our role to play uh, on this planet. And yeah, I, I, I you know, I've, I've I've got my thing and I I do my thing, but I don't think it makes me special. It's just the same as everybody else. Humble, I like that. I mean, and and we were talking about this a little bit in the pre-show. I mean, you've your perspective has changed in in my regards of my experience of you you're you've always been a fierce person you've always been highly intense charged and kind of like a raging bull you know like you just sort of attack things and now something i've noticed in you is there's a little bit more of a patience or give just it's an understanding it seems of the human condition you know the human body Thank you for that. Maybe it's just getting older, you know, and having having gone through, having gone through these, these experiences. Yes, you're right. I, I have been, I have been very intense all all through my writing career, but particularly since uh, the late 1980s, early 1990s, when I got into this whole mystery of a lost civilization, struck me as an intriguing, fascinating mystery from our from our past. And and I, I was I was initially surprised at the amount of vitriol and hatred that my ideas stirred up Mm. amongst archaeologists and amongst their friends in the media and generally amongst mainstream orthodox thinkers in general. Um, Mm. I was treated from the outset uh, like an enemy. I was treated like a pariah. I was I was attacked. I was vilified. Ideas were attributed to me that I never held. Uh, and then those ideas were attacked as though I did hold them, uh, and I guess it, it made me very defensive. And I began to feel, I began to feel that I'm in some kind of, I'm in some kind of battle here. Mm-hmm. This is not just a, this is not just an exchange of ideas. This is not, this is not simply me trying to contribute what I think might be useful to a, to an intelligent and, cons- and constructive debate. This is actually an ideological war. Uh, mm. Where I am up against, where I am up against people who wish to misrepresent me in any in any possible way, uh, in order to diminish the impact of the ideas that I'm that I'm putting forward. So I I, I really took my cue from that. I I felt attacked, and and I guess I went into attack mode myself. Maybe mm. philosophically that was a mistake. I was a younger man then. But that's uh, that's how I, I I took it. If people if people are going to fight me, I'm going to fight them back. Right. That, was, that was the kind of attitude that I took, and I guess I did become, you know, a bit of a a bit of a fighter in this field. And I'm sure I've said some harsh words, uh, and you know maybe I should reflect on 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 all of that just because, you know, some 
asshole in some university says harsh words about me, it doesn't mean I have to say harsh words back. Though perhaps these are the lessons that I'm learning. Yeah, I mean, Graham. So it's a perfect segue into your work and the the nature of the the mystery behind some some of the history that that is part of the human story. I mean, why do you think why do you think that your work has been vilified? Why why do you think that just the the sort of exploration of these ideas is is such a subject of such controversy well i think <clears throat> i think there's a complicated set of reasons for that uh, and part of it is uh, to do with the the way that science and within science as a subdiscipline of science archaeology uh, defined itself uh, in the in the 19th century there were a lot of very sloppy ideas in the, around in the 19th century. People bought fully into the biblical narrative. There was a lot of superstition. People believed that the earth was only 6,000 years old and, you know, bullshit like that. Uh, and, and science actually did need to get rid of all that baggage. It did need to get rid of the, 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 the superstitions and the unthought out arguments and the unevidenced claims. And it did need to replace them with solid evidence. But in the, in the process, I think that science threw the baby out with the bathwater hmm. uh, and it became a very, a very narrow focused uh, field, which was based on weighing and measuring and, and, and counting. And in the case of archeology, span of interpreting often very thin and limited quantities of, of data. However, the role of the archeologist may seem obscure uh, but it is, in fact, extremely important because ha what archaeologists are, they're the profession, they're the so-called experts who we have entrusted with the role of interpreting our own past to us. Uh, we have handed that role over to them, just like we hand over to the surgeon the role of removing our appendix, because the surgeon is an expert in removing appendices. So also we, we hand over the role of interpreting our past to the archaeologists, because they're supposed to be the experts in in our past. But, sure. uh, you know, an appendix is a little bit different from the human past. Uh, an appendix, our, our, our appendix or any other organ of the body does not cause us to define ourselves in certain ways, whereas our notion of our past uh, is fundamental to our understanding of our present and, and to our definition of who we are. Uh, and and uh, if we've got the past radically wrong, then that is a that is a very serious error, which which is not simply academic, but but impacts our whole notion of what the human adventure is about and what we're doing here and what our what our story really is. And I think that this is where ideology enters into the picture uh, and where someone such as myself or, or colleagues like John, the late great John Anthony West or, or, or Robert Boval uh, ended up getting attacked was because we were, we were offering an alternative view of the human past and we were not doing so in the way that archaeologists would have liked us to do so. Archaeologists would have liked us to do so with flimsy arguments, with unevidenced speculations, mm. uh, fantasy and, and woo-woo, whereas actually what we did was we presented solidly documented evidence. We, we backed up our, our findings and our research. Where, and, and, and this has is, this is, uh, be, been my project from, from the beginning, is to present a thorough, coherently argued alternative view of the human past, which leaves room for an extraordinary possibility. And that is that we may be a species with amnesia, that we may have lost a whole chapter of the human story, and that in losing that whole chapter of the human story, archaeologists are implicated because of their approach and their research methods and their rather dogmatic insistence that the past is a certain way and cannot be any other way really the whole archaeological profession will without really thinking about the matter just as an automatic knee-jerk reaction will reject and despise and pour scorn upon the notion of a of a lost civilization of the ice age hmm. because if that notion is correct then the whole foundations of the archaeological profession and much more importantly the whole foundations of our understanding of our past as the human species are wrong and archaeology bears a heavy responsibility for that so rather than and i think it's perfectly understandable uh, but but it's just it's just the way things are people do defend their 
territory rather than saying, OK, well, let's look at these ideas. Let's see if there's something to them from the very beginning. Uh, those professional interpreters of our past who we call archaeologists have reacted to my work by saying, even though they often have not read a word of it, mm. have reacted to my work by saying, this is complete rubbish. This man is trying to mislead the public. Uh, he's a fantasist. He's a liar. He's he's making things up. And obviously, when you're at the receiving end of that kind of shit, after a while, it makes you it makes you angry, especially when, as is uh, as is the case with me, as is, as was the case with John Anthony West, as is the case with with Robert Boval, we're honestly and genuinely trying to give the public our take on the past. We're not trying to delude anybody or mislead anybody. We're saying that there may be serious problems with the archaeological representation of the past. This is what we think the, the problems are uh, here. And here is the documentary evidence to prove it. Take this away. Go think about it. And maybe what you've been taught in school is not something that you will just accept at face value uh, any longer. Yes, yes. I feel that. Feel that. So, Graham, okay, so now let's move into America before. I've got this book in my hand right now. I mean, it's a dense read. It's not your casual everyday. I mean, it's it, it's packed full of information. You talk about so much. You talk about this idea that perhaps America was, you know, also related to the pyramids of Giza. You mention the the site in Mount Mountville, Alabama, where yeah. you point to similarities between this Native American site and you know something that that Giza is pointing to. What was what was that similarity? What's the connection there? <clears throat> let me be let me be clear about this. For, firstly, as to the um, density of the book. Um, which uh, which I hope is is also nonetheless makes a good read because it's my personal story and it's my Great read. my my adventure through the through the Americas. But but I feel it, again it's important not to be flimsy. Uh, my 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 project is to uh, in my most ambitious moments I would say that my project is ultimately perhaps not in my lifetime but through through the ideas that my work and the work of others have contributed is to bring about a rewriting of the prehistory of the human species. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and since we are dealing with a prehistory of the human species that has pretty much been set in stone for the last 150 years and that is defended by a powerful group of uh, so-called experts uh, named archaeologists, uh, in order to do that, it's essential to put forward solid thoroughly based evidence based arguments uh, which which can which can weigh in on that on that battlefield so i don't shy away from that it's necessary i do, and i don't patronize my readers either i think that i think that my readers are intelligent questioning people uh, mm. and that they're and that they're capable uh, of working through the evidence as i as I present it, and that's why that's why the book is is thoroughly documented, has one thousand five hundred footnotes, mm -hmm. um, and and includes interviews and many encounters with mainstream uh, scientists from many different fields, not just archaeologists, but also, for example, uh, geneticists. Um, and then, secondly, the, the 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 situation in the in the Americas is particularly dire. As regards archaeology, uh, nobody until very recently, and perhaps perhaps I'm perhaps I'm amongst the first, has really seriously considered the possibility that the origins of civilization may actually be in the Americas, in the so-called New World, rather than in the so-called Old World. It's something that we almost take in with our mother's milk. We're taught this outlook from from childhood in school uh, and, and on through university, wherever we live in the world, we are taught that civilization is an old world invention, that it began somewhere in the Fertile Crescent. Typically, the ancient civilization of the Sumerians is cited as the origins of civilization. There's even a book called History Begins at Sumer. And it's thought that about 6,000 years ago, after four thousand or so four or five thousand years of gradual preparation of of developing agriculture of developing stable communities that about six thousand years ago the first real cities emerged in mesopotamia 
between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, and this became the Sumerian civilization, and it was supposedly the first civilization of history, and then civilization spread out across the old world. But the fixed and firm view uh, is that there was no such thing as a great <coughs> city-based civilization uh, in the Americas until much, 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 much later than that. Mm. Uh, this this was the fixed view, and the notion that the notion that actually the whole idea of civilization could have originated in the Americas uh, has been completely rejected by archaeology and re regards it totally as old world property. Uh, and what I've set out to do in America before is to show uh, that that uh, is not correct, uh, and that the Americas have been particularly badly served. By archaeology, uh, American American archaeology is a subdiscipline within the global discipline of archaeology, uh, and of course, archaeology largely deals with prehistory. Um, w w when we're dealing with written documents, uh, it's more a matter to do with history rather than archaeology. But when we're dealing with interpretation of artifacts and of uh, 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 and of for example megalithic sites around the world where there are no written documents that that tends to be the discipline of archaeology and of course archaeology is a subject that's studied in in virtually every country in the world but in the americas there has there has for a very long time been a very rigid fixed and firm view uh, about the origins of civilization and American archaeologists have simply refused, adamantly refused to consider the possibility that civilization might have had much more ancient origins and, than they suppose and furthermore that those origins might not have been in the so-called old world but might have been in the new world. Mm -hmm. And we can, see this, we can see underlying this a kind of dogma. Admittedly now, within the last Within the last seven or eight years, archaeologists, American archaeologists, have begun to fess up and to and to admit to the public. Even, you know, prestigious institutions like the the Smithsonian have now put this in writing that, unfortunately, unintentionally, without it being deliberately so, archaeology, archaeology, American archaeology, has grotesquely misled the public about the story of the peopling of the Americas. Once you start talking about civilization, you must first ask yourself, when did people arrive in the Americas? That's the fundamental mm. question. You can't have any kind of civilization until you have people living in the Americas. And right through into the 21st century, it's only they've only really begun to admit that they got it all wrong since about 2009, 2010. Right through into the 21st century, it was the firmly held view of archaeologists that this view took root round about the 1960s and it held for 50 years, for half a century, that there had been no human beings in the Americas before 13,400 years ago. A very specific date there and that date connects to a culture that archaeologists call the Clovis culture. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the people of the Clovis culture called themselves. That's a name that archaeologists have uh, given to that culture, which we know, almost everything we know about them, we know from their stone tools that they left behind. Uh, the reason why they're called the Clovis culture is very, very simple and, and, and worth bearing in mind because, because it indicates the un the unstated things about our past. We hear the Clovis culture, a lot of us think, oh, that's what they call themselves. No, it's not what they call themselves. It's what archaeologists call them. And the reason that archaeologists call them the Clovis culture is that the first major Clovis so-called type site to be excavated was Blackwater Draw uh, in New Mexico. Uh, and the archaeologists there back in the 60s who were excavating that site, they couldn't get beer at Blackwater Draw. But 20 miles down the road at Clovis, New Mexico, they could get beer. Uh, and that's why we now call this culture who were supposedly the first Americans, we call them 
the Clovis culture. Mm -hmm. And around this evolved a dogma called Clovis First, which adamantly claimed that the Clovis culture were the first Americans. They arrived 13,400 years ago. There were no human beings in the Americas before that. I mean, if you pause to think about it, that's such a weird idea mm -hmm. because, the, because the large animal species, the megafauna that are found in, in Northeast Asia, in Siberia, for example, are all, were also found in, in the Americas for hundreds of thousands of years before that, obviously, animal species were going back and forward, but somehow archaeologists became convinced that human beings weren't doing so. So it became the, uh, and, and I will use that word quite deliberately and specifically without any apology, it became a dogma of archaeology, uh, as powerful as, as, as any of the dogmas of the Catholic Church. It became a dogma of archaeology that there were no human beings in the Americas before 13,400 years ago. And any archaeologist who dared to question that dogma, who had the misfortune to stumble across a site with evidence that human beings had been present there much earlier, for example, Jacques Saint Mars, a Canadian archaeologist at Bluefish Caves in the Yukon, finding evidence of human beings there 24,000 years ago. For example, Al Goodyear, who's professor of archaeology at the University of South Carolina, excavating the Topper site in South Carolina, finding evidence that humans had been there 50,000 years ago. For example, Dr. Tom Demeray, who's the chief paleontologist at the San Diego Natural History Museum who published a, a major paper in the rigorous peer-reviewed journal Nature on the 26th of April 2017 concerning the excavation of a site called the Ceruti Mastodon site, evidencing human presence in the Americas 130,000 years ago. Uh, all of these individuals who were proposing a notion that was not accepted by archaeological dogma have found themselves under massive attack from the rest of the archaeological profession. So not only, not only was there a dogma that there were no human beings here before 13,400 years ago, but there was also a kind of Clovis police, which ideologically policed evidence and ideas in this area and thoroughly worked to expunge and destroy any ideas that questioned the dogma. And this went on for far too long. It's a shame to the archaeological profession. Some of them are now denying that it even happened, uh, but it happened. Uh, and prestigious institutions such as Nature, such as the Smithsonian Institution, have at least had the honesty to admit this in the last in the last 10 years. You know, it's, it's often the case with, with archaeology when they get things wrong, that they kind of try to rewrite the story later and say, well, this is what we believed all the time. And some of them are saying it now, but the record is clear, and I document that record thoroughly uh, in America before. This is a, a, a shame uh, to the world of archaeology that this dogma was allowed to hold in place for so long in the Americas, and it has held back grievously our understanding of the human past because the result was that no funding was available for archaeologists who wished to look in older deposits. You know, in archaeology, the, the, the closer something is to the surface, the younger it is. And the deeper down you dig, the, the older it is mm -hmm. uh, because, because these strata are laid down in layers on the, on, on the Earth's surface. And for a long time, it was, it was held to be ridiculous that any archaeologist would, re would seek research funding to dig beneath the Clovis layer because archaeology supposedly had already established that Clovis were the first Americans. And therefore, what was the point of spending money looking deeper? Well, the answer is now we have the evidence from all over the Americas of vastly more ancient sites, not only in North America, but also in Central America and in South America, evidence of sites going back tens of thousands of years. And for so long, this evidence was missed or minimized or shoved off to the side simply because of that almost fanatical religious dogma uh, called called Clovis first. And I'll call it as I see it. Archaeology has failed the world public when it comes to the story of the peopling of the Americas. And it is only now waking up to the absolute magnitude and depth of that failure. But the implications of that failure don't only concern the issue of when people first came to the Americas, and now the evidence is very strong that that was at least <clears throat> 130,000 years ago, mm -hmm. which is twice as long as human beings were present in Europe, for example, and twice as long as they seem to have been present in Australia. We have a human presence in the Americas twice as long as that, 10 times 
as old as Clovis. What was happening during those 130,000 years where adamantly for so long archaeologists simply refused to look? And it's my case that we've missed a really important part of the human story in the Americas as a result of that archaeological dogma. But also there's more to it than that. The Americas did suffer a gigantic cataclysm between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And that cataclysm too played a part in sweeping the record clean. Hmm, wow, it's it's a lot. To, it's a lot of information to take in, Graham. And I, you know, I appreciate your thoroughness. I appreciate your your imme- the immense amount of research and collection of information that you've connected the dots for us. You know, so I, I want I really want to bring up the the relationship between the Giza site in mm-hmm. Egypt and the 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 Book of the Dead, the Duat, yes. and the yes, you, the, you began with that, and yes. then I went off on a tangent. <laughs> yeah. I'm re- I'm re- I'm recalling now, but it all it all it all ties together in a certain way. Yes, as I was researching uh, America before, I was I was very surprised to discover that certain really fundamental and very distinctive and idiosyncratic ideas that are part of the ancient Egyptian spiritual system uh, are also found in almost identical form amongst the ancient cultures of the Mississippi Valley. Uh, in in North America, and and as I was as I dug deeper in this, and again the the full reasoning behind this and the evidence behind this is given in the book. As I as I dug deeper into this, it became clear to me that this was not uh, coincidence, nor was it evidence of some kind of ancient Egyptian missionary expedition to North America uh, in ancient historical times, or vice versa, nor was it evidence of an ancient American missionary expedition to the Nile Valley Mm -hmm. in ancient historical times. This is evidence that goes back deep into prehistory. This evidence goes back to the last ice age. The reason for these similarities, and I'll go into some of them in a moment, the reason for these similarities is that both the cultures of the Mississippi Valley and the culture of ancient Egypt inherited a shared legacy from a remote common ancestor. Just as two individuals uh, today who don't actually know they're related in any way, if their DNA testing is done, it can be found that 50 generations back, actually, they did have a common ancestor. The signal is still there in the DNA. So it is with cultural material. Uh, and, and, and in the cultural DNA of the ancient Egyptians and in the cultural DNA of the Mississippi Valley are certain distinctive ideas. And the only way that those ideas can be explained is that both of these widely separated cultures uh, received them as a legacy from a much earlier culture that influenced both regions uh, and that must have done so uh, before 12,000 years ago. In other words, during the last ice age. So we're looking at a legacy here. Uh, and that and that legacy, uh, just to give you a few examples, which you find both in the Mississippi Valley uh, and in ancient Egypt, appears to be the legacy of a very ancient religion. Uh, and I believe that this was, a, it's not the only aspect of the legacy, geometry, astronomy, all kinds of sciences are part of that that as well Mm -hmm. but this was a this was i believe the religion of the lost civilization and it concerned a a deep investigation into the mystery of life after death Mm. so both in ancient egypt uh, and in the ancient mississippi valley the the constellation of orion uh, was incredibly important uh, the ancient the ancient egyptians saw orion as the celestial (coughs) excuse me (coughs) as the celestial figure of the god Osiris, uh, the god of resurrection and rebirth. Uh, And for the ancient Egyptians, the notion was that the soul of the deceased would make a kind of leap to the heavens, would rise up to the sky after death, uh, and would uh, would enter a kind of portal in the constellation of Orion and would pass through that portal to the Milky Way, where it would then make a journey along the Milky Way, which was in the heart of what the ancient Egyptians called the Duat, the afterlife kingdom. Mm-hmm. And on that journey along the Milky Way, the soul would be held to account for the life that he or she had lived and would face challenges and ordeals that were appropriate to the uh, good things or the bad things that had been done during the course of the life that was given to that, to, to, to that soul. So I was very surprised 
when I came to Moundville in Alabama uh, with no prior knowledge of this uh, to find uh, exactly the same set of ideas there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And anybody who cares to go to Moundville can see all this written up in great detail on notice boards around the site and and in the museum where certain artifacts are are shown. Again, the the constellation of Orion plays a key role. Uh, In the Mississippi Valley, it's not represented as a man in the sky. It's represented as a hand and forearm in the sky. The three stars of Orion's belt form the wrist of the hand, Uh, other stars form the thumb and the fingers, and there is a portal uh, in the palm of that hand which corresponds with the Orion Nebula that lies in the sky directly beneath the three stars of Orion's belt. And again, just as in ancient Egypt, there's this concept of a of a leap, a soaring leap to the sky, uh, passing through that portal in Orion and then making a journey along the banks of the Milky Way where the soul will be held to account and faced with challenges and ordeals generated by the life that that individual has lived on Earth. And and, um, there are many, many, many uh, remarkable similarities between the ancient Egyptian afterlife realm and the Mississippi Valley afterlife realm. For example, both of those afterlife realms are filled with gigantic winged serpents, in both cases, there is a, a feline creature. It's called the underwater panther in the Native American tradition. It's called the sphinx in, uh, in, in Egypt. We still have, of course, a giant sphinx on the Giza Plateau. It has a human head now. But uh, when it was originally made more than 12,000 years ago, as I and my colleagues have long argued, uh, it had also the head of a lion. Uh, that head was heavily eroded over thousands of years and was carved down into a human head wearing the classic nemesis headdress of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs uh, in historical times, around about 4,500 years ago, because the, ex- the previous lion head had been so badly damaged by erosion. Um, it's very curious that on the path of souls in the Native American tradition, the underwater panther, we have surviving representations of the underwater panther, and it looks exactly like the Great Sphinx of Giza, right down to intimate details like the positions of its paws and the way that its tail curves, curves, around, its, curves around its back. Um, and, and there are many, many, many more examples of this sort that I go into in great detail. You know, one or two of them could be a coincidence. But when you start adding them all together, uh, I'll give you another another example, and that sure. concerns the the entity called the Birdman in Native American tradition. The Birdman is a is a hero deity in the Mississippian religious system. He represents the triumph of life over death, and he is depicted as a, a, a man with a, with a human body, but with the head of a hawk. Uh, And we have an identical figure playing an identical role in ancient Egypt. And he's the god Horus. Uh, He's the hero deity. He represents the triumph of life after death and he also of life over death. And he also is represented with the figure, the the body of a man and the and and the head of a hawk. And I could go on endlessly about this, but that's why I wrote the book. And those who want the detail on this and why I must conclude that this is the result of a legacy that's more than 12,000 years old rather than any kind of missionary expedition during historical periods. The evidence for that is, is set out in detail in America before. Yes, yes, yes. It's in, it's in the book. We're in, but Graham, I, I really want to ask you, you know, these are these are cultures that are separated by both geography and time. But yeah. yet, the, and you mentioned it just now, there are these coincidences that come up over and over and over. And it seems like there is some sort of message that we're being indicated towards or led to, and perhaps even, you know, based on corporate interest or something else, you know, based on maybe the conditions of the system here, the earth life system, but this information is kept from us. So there almost seems to be two groups of people, people who are in the know, people who know about this and people who don't know about this. So, you know, um, how, how can all these different cultures be pointing at the same thing at, at different points in time separated by thousands of years. And that's precisely why I argue that it's uh, a legacy uh, rather than the result of direct contact. Uh, I mean, there couldn't possibly have been direct contact between Moundville in Alabama, which is a thousand years old, 
uh, and the ancient Egyptian civilization, which vanished from history at the end of the Roman period, about 600 years before Moundville was even created. Uh, if we if we find as we do, and again it's thoroughly documented in in the book, if we find these astonishing range of similarities that cannot be a coincidence, then we have to explain it, and we can't explain it by direct contact. We, the only way to explain it is that both of these cultures inherited a legacy which was passed down culturally over hundreds and thousands of generations, which manifested in Egypt in a certain way, which manifested in North America in a certain way. There are many differences between these cultures, and those differences make sense when you realize that these cultures have been evolving separately for tens of thousands of years. But there are many, many striking similarities as well, and those are what I call the cultural DNA uh, that these cultures share, that they inherited from a remote common ancestor that was carefully preserved and passed down and then was brought into play in symbolism, in architecture, uh, in, in great earthworks, uh, or, or all over the world was was manifested. It was always waiting there to be manifested, and at different times in different places, it was manifested. When you get to grips with it, when you get right down to the details, you find that the shared cultural DNA is there. That the same fundamental ideas, the same fundamental mysteries are being are being explored in the same way using the same iconography and this simply cannot be a, 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 a coincidence. The best explanation is that what we're looking at is a global legacy. It wasn't only passed down in the Mississippi Valley and in ancient Egypt. It was passed down in many, many other parts of the world as well. It was passed down in South America uh, and I go into that in detail. There it's, uh, it's integrated with the consumption of the mysterious a visionary brew called ayahuasca mm. and it's not accidental that ayahuasca means the vine of the dead uh, or the vine of souls it was passed down in mesopotamia mesopotamia was not the origin ancient sumer was not the originator of civilization it also was a recipient of this legacy from a civilization that was destroyed at the at the end of the last ice age but nonetheless a civilization from which there were survivors in that cataclysm that unfolded on the earth between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Geologists call that cataclysm the Younger Dryas. There were survivors. Yes, their civilization was destroyed, but there were survivors, and they made it their business to wander the world uh, and to seek to restart civilization and to implant their fundamental ideas amongst the then hunter-gatherers cultures with whom they settled and took refuge. Mm -hmm. uh, and this legacy, once being passed on, then came to fruition at different times in different places. Uh, the, the manifestation of the legacy did not always occur at the same time everywhere around the world. Although I have to say, there is a striking manifestation that does occur between five and 6,000 years ago. We see it in Sumer, we see it in ancient Egypt, and we see it in South America, for example, with the civilization of Karal, the, that great complex of pyramids that lies about 60 miles to the north of Lima in, in Peru, which also dates to around 5,000 years ago. So it seems that there was, some, uh, there was some guiding force behind the scenes in history that chose certain moments to manifest this legacy. And in quite a number of parts of the world, that legacy manifests between 6,000 and 5,000 years ago. But in other parts of the world, it takes longer to manifest. I believe it manifested in North America uh, uh, earlier earlier as well. You can trace back the origins of the so-called mound builder cultures uh, way beyond Moundville in Alabama. Uh, you can trace them back at Poverty Point in Louisiana to 2,500 years ago. You can trace them back to uh, uh, Watson Break in Louisiana to 5,500 years ago. And other, other sites in the lower Mississippi Valley going back eight, 9,000 years, all sharing the same geometry and the same system of ideas. And if only North America had not been so intent on destroying the Native American legacy, which unfortunately is the case. Uh, the Native American legacy of uh, great sites and earthworks and structures in North America was subjected to terrible destruction in the 19th century and through into the 20th century. So just while 
archaeologists were seeking to destroy the cultural ideas by giving only minimal importance to Native American cultures in the 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm not saying that's what archaeology are doing now. They're much more enlightened now, and they recognize the value of ancient American civilizations. But in the 19th and 20, early 20th centuries, the whole project was to justify the uh, Anglo-Saxon conquest of North America uh, and the land grab uh, that that was part of it, the taking away of the lands from the indigenous inhabitants also included destroying all traces that those indigenous inhabitants mm -hmm. were in fact highly civilized. And that's why 90% of the mound builder and earthwork sites that have that were documented in the 19th century are now completely gone they've been plowed under for agricultural land they've been replaced with housing estates or with industrial parks the sites themselves many of them documented in the 19th century are now just completely gone there's nothing there for archaeologists to work with at all you know and no wonder we're a species with amnesia if we're so willing to wipe out our past and no matter how much we regret it now the fact is in north america that so much of that past was deliberately swept away and and destroyed and we're left with really a tiny remnant uh, to work with today mm -hmm. yeah it's so profound your words graham i, I really find the potency potency of them so accurate and you mentioned something that i really wanted to touch on because i find ayahuasca you i find that you know your work dovetails this it's it's as if you you know you explore these two things in your work ayahuasca and these ancient civilizations but in in america before you 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 start to connect these dots for yeah. for this ancient brew or this brew medicine of the soul and these ancient civilizations what is, what is the connection there between this this vine and and this leaf being combined together and these ancient civilizations. Can you connect that for us? There's there's a, there's a lot of points to make here. The first is um, the first the first is a point concerning the character of the lost civilization that it's, I've made it my my project to to attempt to bring back to public attention over the last quarter of a century or so. And I believe that that civilization had a very different character from our own. Uh, that it was less focused on material things, uh, more, more focused on on what our real purpose is on on, on this planet. Um, I can't prove that this is the case, but I, I think our real purpose on this planet uh, is to grow and develop and nurture the soul so that we pass through the experience of life, this un incarnation in a human body, and we learn and grow and develop from it and are able to move on to another level, perhaps after many different lifetimes. That's my personal belief system. Uh, but it also appears to have been the belief system of a civilization of remote antiquity uh, and a belief system that was, as I said, passed down as a legacy uh, in, in many different parts of the world. And one of the things that was different about this civilization from our own uh, was that uh, is that uh, it made use of visionary experiences. Our, our civilization rejects visionary experiences. Uh, we despise. I, I mean, you know, if you want to insult somebody mildly, you might call that person a dreamer. Well, frankly speaking, in the ancient world, to be a dreamer was a really good thing because because dreaming was regarded as one of the valid gateways to true knowledge. Uh, if we understood and explored our dreams carefully, we would learn very important truths. In the modern world, that's completely despised, and dreams are regarded as just completely meaningless fictions of no, Im of no importance whatsoever. And, and also in the modern world, again, there's a new awakening now. The younger generation is waking up and, 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 and are changing things. But for most of the 20th century and well into the 21st, psychedelics were demonized by our society and those who chose to exercise their sovereign right as adults to explore their own consciousness or to or to manage their own health through using these ancient medicinal teacher plants that profoundly alter our state of consciousness anybody who sought to do that risked a jail term uh, risked imprisonment risked having their lives ruined by the authorities 
the lost civilization I'm envisaging uh, had a completely different focus. It regarded these experiences in altered states of consciousness as absolutely fundamental uh, to the human project. And that if we cut ourselves off from these experiences and deny these experiences to ourselves, uh, we're, we're going to lose track of a very important part of what of what we are. And we're also going to fail to benefit from the insights, and the creative uh, understandings that come in altered states of consciousness. Yes, the state of consciousness, our society values, which I call the alert problem solving state of consciousness does have a role. It's an important state of consciousness. I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again. When I get on an airplane, I would like the pilot to be in an alert problem solving state of consciousness. And I would like he or she to remain in that alert problem solving state of consciousness until they land me safely at the airport I'm going to. After that, I don't care what they do with their consciousness. Um, but the alert problem solving state of consciousness is appropriate to certain human activities. But the mistake is to believe it's the only valuable state of consciousness, whereas in fact, we are vastly diverse creatures with enormous potential. Uh, and that potential can be realized through exploring other states of consciousness, either through meditation, either through fasting, either through the use of the teacher plants like, uh, like ayahuasca or the fungi like psy psilocybin uh, or the cacti like uh, pe peyote or, or San Pedro. Sure. Using, these, using these plants brings us into a different state of consciousness, which is not the alert problem-solving state of consciousness, but which is a state of consciousness in which we may have fundamental insights and fundamental creative discoveries that we would not make otherwise, and which is also a state of consciousness in which healing becomes possible possible. Self-healing becomes possible. You know, I, I mean, I'll give you an example. It's not an accident that uh, St Steve Jobs and, and, and uh, what Wozniak, who founded Apple, uh, regarded LSD as very fundamental to their project, that Apple probably would never have been started without LSD. That's an, enough proof, proof uh, alone that, that, that uh, these altered states of consciousness can result in extraordinarily important creative insights. And for a society to deny itself that based on some kind of ideological dogma, uh, which, which elevates the alert problem solving state of consciousness to a kind of monopoly. Uh, that's a, that's a huge mistake. And I think the lost civilization that I've been trying to bring back into public consciousness uh, was, was a civilization that valued and nurtured altered states of consciousness and understood how to amplify and magnify those for the benefit of the whole population. So the Great Pyramid of Giza is not the tomb of a pharaoh. Uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza is a consciousness amplifying engine. Uh, and anybody who has the opportunity to spend time alone inside the Great Pyramid, even thousands of years after it's built, uh, will, will realize that's the case. Uh, sorry, I'm going on at great length, but there was another aspect to your question, and that concerned the ayahuasca brew mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the fact that uh, it has uh, more than one ingredient. Mm -hmm. This is extremely important because it's proof of an ancient science in the Amazon, uh, a, a science that's extremely old. Um, it's a simple fact that there's about 150,000 different species of plants and trees and vines in the Amazon. Uh, but if you want to make ayahuasca, you're going to have to select just two of them, neither of which is psychoactive on its own. Uh, one of them is the bush that bot botanists call Cicotria viridis. Uh, it's called Chacruna in the Amazon. Sure. Its leaves contain dimethyltryptamine. Uh, and the other ingredient is the ayahuasca vine. Now, many in the West, and again, there's a resurgence in interest in this, have experienced dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Uh, many in the, in the modern world have, have experienced this mysterious substance called DMT, arguably the most powerful hallucinogen known to science. And, and typically in Western industrialized societies, this is experienced through smoking or vaping uh, DMT. And when that happens, I've, I guess I've had maybe 15 or 16 uh, trips with uh, vaped DMT. Okay. Uh, when you hit the right dose, you are, you are taken out of your body. There's no argument. There's no discussion. 
if you hit the right dose, you are, you are, your consciousness is just ripped out of your body and you're taken off to a seamlessly convincing, utterly overwhelming parallel realm where things happen very fast, although consciously they may seem to be very slow. Uh, and and um, the overwhelming deluge of, of impressions is so much that it's often difficult to remember anything that happened. You know that you had a profound experience. You have the sense that you downloaded something of great importance, but you don't really know what it is. You come out of it often in a state of confusion. I'm not saying everybody does, but it's very, very commonly the case. So this, the vaped DMT trip is a really is in fact, in, in terms of real minutes, uh, a very short journey. It's eight to 12 minutes that you're in there and then you're out and back, sure. mm -hmm. back into your everyday state of consciousness and, and wondering actually what the hell happened to you. It's so rapid, so overwhelming, it's very difficult to integrate the experiences. So what you'd like is a way to make the power of DMT uh, last longer, for it to be more accessible and perhaps a little more gentle with you than the vaped uh, DMT is. And that's what they've discovered in the Amazon by making the DMT in the leaves of the Chakruna plant orally active. If you take, if you made a tea out of hundreds of Chakruna leaves and drank all of it, yes, you'd be drinking a lot of DMT, mm -hmm. but it would have no effect on you because there's an enzyme in the gut, uh, monoamine oxidase, sure. which switches off DMT on contact. What you need to make it orally active is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And that is found in the ayahuasca vine. Uh, so go figure how that was done by trial and error. Neither the vine nor the leaf are psychoactive on their own, but bring them together and you get an orally active brew that sends you on a journey that is in some ways similar to the DMT journey and in some ways radically different because the, 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 the mother vine ayahuasca is also bringing something incredibly important to the experience. But the most important thing is that it unfolds over four or five hours. It unfolds more slowly, more gently. It's very organic. You have, you have the opportunity to really think about what you're experiencing and to remember it and to integrate it and you emerge – you emerge from the journey with profound teachings that it then becomes your next project is to integrate those teachings uh, into, in, in, into your daily life. Well, I would call this science in the Amazon to, to, to put these two plants together, which don't work on their own, but only work in combination and to create this brew, which is honestly changing the world all over the world today. The ayahuasca the, uh, the ayahuasca experience is no longer limited to the Amazon jungle. It's come out of the rainforest. It's spread all around the world. You can drink ayahuasca in Tokyo or London or New York or Chicago or, or, or wherever you happen to be. You can drink it in Cairo. Uh, you, can, you can drink it in Istanbul. You know, it's, it's, it's available everywhere under the radar, illegal, but available because there's something in it that calls to people, that people realize there's an important experience that they have been denied by their societies, uh, which they need to have. And in this sense, the teacher plant ayahuasca, uh, the teacher brew ayahuasca, which is, as I said, a mixture of two plants, um, is having an impact uh, all around the world at the moment. And I would say, again, we're looking at a legacy here. This is knowledge from a lost civilization of prehistoric antiquity. And it's not, by the way, the only evidence of science in the Amazon. There's mm -hmm. a great more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it's anyone who explores this avenue of thought, I think, will be very surprised at how much information there is around this plant and the, the usage of it, you know, how far it goes back and how much it can change your life. But you know, moving forward, and uh, I just want to remind everyone, we're about an hour deep. We have about 30 minutes left with Graham. So if you want to ask your question, we're taking text questions. You can join the Discord server. You'll see that link at the bottom of your screen. And, and Graham, I do have some questions here for you. I have one more of my own. Um, okay, so, you know, something that I noticed, Graham, in your work, and I've been reading your work for more than five years, is that there, there seems to be, you know, between your fiction and nonfiction, because you're, you write in both of these styles. And yeah. it seems... Uh, do, if I could just jump in okay, there. Yes, okay. yes, I do write novels, but almost nobody reads them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I read them. They are, they are published. Uh, I've, I've written a series of three novels about the Spanish conquest of Mexico called War God. And I've written the first of two novels of a, a, a time slip novel uh, called Entangled. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and for me, this is a it's a fascinating writing 
exercise. My my main writing project is my non-fiction work, books like Fingerprints of the Gods, books like Magicians of the Gods, uh, and my latest book, America Before. These are all non-fiction, factual books. Uh, but as a writer, I found it challenging and interesting to also dabble in fiction on the side. Because, for example, when I came to tell the story of the Spanish conquest of Mexico in my War God series, it, it was very important for me to get inside the heads of those real historical characters. And I found that in writing in that way, I was able to understand more about the historical events than if I'd approached them solely as a nonfiction writer. But I am fundamentally a writer of factual uh, non fiction books. Uh, and I'm just blessed that I've had the opportunity from time to time to write some novels as well. I mean, it, at the, near, the, near the end, Graham, at, at, of, the, of America Before, the, you tie in ESP and the possible use of telekinesis to move around these, these large blocks. And what I notice in your, in your fiction work is it, it does get, you know, somewhat sci-fi in, in your book. So I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, if, if there's something you might be holding back you know, from well, I've had I've had reason. Obviously, since I've been since I've been on a kind of quest for a lost civilization of prehistoric antiquity for for more than twenty five years now, uh, I have I have developed some ideas and some notion uh, of of what the of, of what the character of that civilization was. And as I said earlier, I think it was very different from our own. I think it did enshrine the use of psychedelics and of the teacher plants as a fundamental part of the character of that civilization. But I also think it did tech, it did technology in a very different way from the way we do it. And I've, I've received a lot of sneering and dismissive criticism from the mainstream for even contemplating that there may be innate and untapped human abilities, which we in modern society are not using but which ancient civilizations and particularly the lost civilization that I address myself to had mastered fully. Mm. Uh, we have gone down a particular technological road with modern industrial civilization, and that's what I call the road of leverage and mechanical advantage. If we want to get stuff done, we invent machines to do it on our behalf. We, we um, divest the direct manipulation of matter to mechanical devices. Uh, and we're very, very good at that particular kind of tech uh, of developing and deploying mechanical devices. And we're, we're so confident of their utility and so satisfied with what they do for us that we invest all our efforts and ingenuity and intelligence in making ever better, more sophisticated, cleverer machines. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I would suggest that in the process, uh, because we have become, we have come to rely on machinery as the intervention between us and the world of matter, uh, we may have allowed other innate faculties of the human creature to lapse or to go dormant. Uh, and I, although I will be despised for saying this, and although there will be many uh, of, a, of a materialist frame of mind who will simply mock me without considering further for saying this, I think that powers such as telepathy, such as, such as telekinesis, hmm. which we have much anecdotal evidence of today uh, and which are utterly despised and rejected by the mainstream, I think they're part of the human legacy too. Uh, just, as, just as we have the ability to turn our brains to making very clever machines – to manipulate matter. So it may also have been in the past that we were able to manipulate matter directly through the power of the mind. Uh, and as I say this, I can just see the sneering and rejecting comments that come up. But these are matters that we should investigate. And where you have, uh, uh, for example, the, the Institute of no Noetic Sciences sure. is mm -hmm. looking into I I issues like this in a serious way. Oh, Graham, we lost you there for a second. I think you might be covering your microphone. Oh, possibly. Uh, okay. No worries. Okay, you're back. I'm back. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just saying that, that rather than reject and despise the notion that human beings may have psychic powers, may have telep telepathic powers, may have the uh, uh, ability to manipulate matter as in telekinesis through the power of the mind, 
um, we, we, should, we should look more seriously into that rather than just automatically knee-jerk rejecting it. And my, my suggestion is that the lost civilization I'm interested in uh, had amplified those kind of powers to a high degree so that those who were confronted by them would almost feel they were confronted by magic. Uh, but it's not magic. It's an innate human faculty that unfortunately in the modern world we have allowed to lapse. Mm -hmm. All right, Graham, we've got we've got a bunch of questions that I want to get to. I promised everyone listening that we'd get to these questions. So this one, the first one comes from Enki. He asks uh, or he or she asks uh, in your research, did you come across the haplogroup X2A subject? And if you did, what were your thoughts on this? Yeah, the, 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 the haplogroup XTA, to be honest, is something I don't know that much about. Okay, fair enough. Uh, moving forward, Starchild asks, Hello, Mr. Hancock. I am Starchild, the comic book hero you met in Seattle. Could you talk about the significance of the pine cone in ancient history slash American history? Well, the argument is that the, the pine cone represents the pineal gland, uh, which is regarded as the third eye in many different cultures around the world. The third eye, uh, which gives us a sixth sense, if you were, that integrates us with the universe beyond this universe. Um, and, and it's interesting that that very substance, uh, dimethyltryptamine, DMT, that is fundamental to the ayahuasca experience is a natural brain hormone. Uh, all human beings have DMT, usually in sub-psychedelic quantities in their bodies. Uh, and while it would be premature to claim that DMT is actually made in the pineal gland, there's evidence that it, the lungs also play a part in the generation of DMT in the human body. It's certainly found in the pineal gland. Uh, and, and the suggestion is that the, the pine cone represents this power of insight into realms beyond this realm. Hmm. Um, thank you. Thanks, Graham, for answering that. Uh, Sean asks, what are your thoughts on the Rikat structure in Mauritania? Yeah, the Rishat structure is, uh, uh, is a structure of circular rings in uh, West Africa in Mauritania. Uh, it's a very interesting structure. There's been a lot uh, of good material put out about this on the Internet in, in recent months. Um, pay tribute to a to a YouTube channel called Bright Insight, who I think were the first to really draw attention to the Rishat structure. What's interesting about it, it when you view it from from uh, aerial imagery, uh, is the this series of circular concentric rings, uh, which of course are exactly how Plato described the lost city of Atlantis, uh, and this is why the site has attracted so much attention. I think the site is interesting. I think the uh, evidence that has been put forward for it uh, is at least justifies a, a thorough excavation and investigation of that site. The very first thing we have to do is to rule out weird geology. Geology is an amazing thing, you know. The, the, the Earth's natural features often have a way of uh, presenting themselves as though they are man-made when they are not. So we need to be sure that that's not the case with the Rishat structure. And we'll only be sure of that with boots on the ground uh, and an excavation. If it is not weird geology, if it is archaeology, and we're not there yet, but if it is archaeology, then it has the potential to rewrite human history. It's a fascinating, fascinating site. And I'm certainly keeping an eye on it and seeing what's developing there. Mm -hmm. Okay. A D. Craig asks, Hi, Graham. Are you familiar with the work of Chan Thomas, specifically the Adam and Eve story yeah people keep have kept drawing this to my attention while i've been on the road in america no the answer is i'm not familiar with that um i'm only one person and i'm not familiar with everything i i do i do the the best that i can to document what i know but this adam and eve story seems to be a youtube channel and perhaps there's a book behind it somewhere um this is what i this is what i've been told it's something that i intend to investigate when i get home to england after this this long speaking tour around america Okay, interesting. Um, it, someone asks, Mr. Hancock, what kind of experience have you had with salvia divinorum, if any? I've had experience with salvia, salvia divinorum. Uh, I've had a couple of uh, smoked journeys with, uh, with salvia. 
um, in both of them an intense sense of disassociation uh, of entering another realm uh, of sitting on a sort of pinnacle with vast drops beneath me uh, as though I'm as though I'm sitting on a, a, a bar stool that's 20 miles high and I'm looking down at the earth below um, most of all the feeling of dis- disassociation and of and of being of encountering a parallel realm that I don't fully understand um, I've only as I say had a couple of experiences with with salvia it's certainly very intriguing I would say it's another one of those teacher plants that uh, that that nature has kindly gifted us mm. Indeed. Um, Tripped, here's an interesting one. He asks, uh, he or she, or they ask, uh, what what do you think about the modern religions, all the modern religions being connected or interpreted as the, the uh, same flood survivor's knowledge? Oh, I think that's, I think that's a very reasonable speculation. The, 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 the way that the notion of a global flood is most widely known still in uh, in the world today is, is through the biblical story the which has been preserved by the abrahamic religions uh, christianity judaism and islam the story of the flood of noah uh and and uh, poorly worked out biblical bibli- bibli- biblical chronologies uh you know used to put that event at just a few thousand years ago but there was no global flood a few thousand years ago but there was a massive global flood, uh, both at the beginning and at the end of the Younger Dryas. And this is the cataclysm that I go into in great depth in America before, uh, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Uh, 11,600 years ago, you have what geologists call meltwater pulse 1B. It's when the last of the North American and European ice caps just collapse into the sea and massively raise sea level. And if we're looking for a moment in history that can be uh, described as the global flood, uh, it would be then, it would be 11,600 years ago, it would be meltwater pulse 1B. And it's not an accident that 11,600 years ago uh, is exactly the date that Plato gives us for the destruction and submergence of the lost civilization of Atlantis. Plato is often accused of making Atlantis up. Uh, by archaeologists, they say he fabricated fabricated the whole story uh, for a political motive. Uh, Plato is the earliest surviving source of the Atlantis tradition, but if you go into the dialogues of Timias and Critias and the backstory, you'll find that Plato is telling us that Atlantis was destroyed and submerged by flood 11,600 years ago from our time, uh, a date that we would call 9,600 BC, which was 9,000 years before the time of the Greek lawmaker Solon, uh, who visited Egypt in 600 BC and first received the story of Atlantis, which was then passed down in the family line to Plato. So if Plato made the whole thing up, he was astonishingly on the money with the latest geological information about massive sea level rise uh, 11,600 years ago. And I think that there are the more than 2,000 so-called flood myths that we find around the world are all memories of this cataclysmic event that brought the last ice age suddenly and dramatically to an end. Hmm. Last one from the audience, guys. If if I miss your question, I apologize. There were many that came through. Mark asks, uh, Graham, have you have you seen the very unique and widely unknown pyramids ruin ruins above Tonala? Uh, Chiapas, Mexico? No, I haven't. Okay. As I, as I say, I'm only one person. I stretch myself pretty thin. I've seen a lot of the world. I've seen some amazing and majestic and mysterious pyramid sites all around the world, but I haven't seen those ones. They think you know everything. I mean, they, they're, you're, you're a hero to them. Everything. I just know a little and I try to put it together and to back it up with evidence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've done that in America before and I mean, it's, it's, it was such a great read to go through. I had, a, I had some help going through it. I mean, it, it's a lot of material. I was actually in the jungle and looking through the book, so it was really surprising that, you know, you connected these dots about this sort of migration into North America. And, and then also, you know, this... One, this we, we, somebody, asked, somebody asked earlier about, about haplogroups, and this, hmm. is, this is the language of genetics. Okay. Uh, I do actually go into genetic issues in 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 great detail in America before. Just I wanted not, to bring this up, yeah. Just not into haplogroup uh, X two A, but uh, what is what what particularly intrigues me about new evidence from the the science of genetics and the study of ancient DNA uh, is a very curious DNA signal. 
uh, that is found only in two parts of the world. Uh, one part of the world is Australasia, uh, Papua New Guinea, the Melanesian peoples of Papua New Guinea and Australian Aborigines. And the other part of the world is right in the heart of the Amazon jungle, uh, where you this same DNA signal rings out very, very loudly. And we know it's been in the Amazon jungle from the discovery of ancient skeletal remains that have been DNA tested. We know it's been there uh, since the end of the last ice age. It's extremely ancient and it implies that somebody was capable of crossing the Pacific Ocean and bringing a reproductively viable population from Australasia to the Amazon jungle uh, during the last ice age. This is really intriguing because it completely contradicts, again, the, the mainstream view that our ancestors during the ice age were not capable of crossing a, a, a major ocean. If, if they had come by land, you would find that DNA signal in North America and in Central America as well. Uh, but the fact that you only find it in South America and in Australasia uh, indicates that an oceanic voyage of a reproductively viable population was undertaken. And furthermore, it indicates that that voyage was from Australasia to South America because the signal is much stronger in Australasia than it is in South America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is this question is in my list. I mean, it's like you're reading my mind. It's amazing. So, so there was a the, the DNA signal. Can you be a little bit more precise? What does the signal mean? What does it tell people? Well, what it tells what it tells people again, it's this issue of a of a legacy, and in this case, a, a very specific genetic legacy. Uh, very a very specific cluster of DNA that is only found in Australasia and in the Amazon jungle. Uh, the, 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 y you should find it all the way through the Americas if the, the traditional story of the peopling of the Americas were correct. And the traditional story of the peopling of the Americas uh, is that it all came uh, overland uh, through a lot from Siberia across the Bering Straits when the Bering Straits were a land bridge uh, through an ice free corridor between the North American ice caps down into North America thence onwards into Central America thence onwards into South America if that were the only story then the same very distinctive Australasian DNA signal would be found all over the Americas but to find it only in South America and only among certain tribes in the Amazon jungle uh, is uh, indicative that it must have resulted from an oceanic voyage during mm. the Ice Age uh, and not only a voyage but a voyage of a reproductively viable population uh, who were settled in the Amazon and oddly enough the Tucano who are an ayahuasca drinking culture of the Amazon have an origin myth which speaks of exactly such a settlement mission. They tell of how their ancestors uh, in the remotest past were not originally from the Amazon, that they were brought to the Amazon by a group of quote unquote superhumans who included the daughter of the sun, who taught them the use of fire and who taught them horticulture uh, and the, uh, a superhuman helmsman who steered the serpent shaped canoe with which their ancestors were ushered into the Amazon river system uh, and, and shown which were the best places for them to settle and to plant their fields and to make their villages and to, uh, and to hunt. Uh, and, and then those so-called superhumans left the ancestors of the Tucano there, and they're still there to this day, and their culture, the, their descendants are still there to this day, and their culture revolves around the use of ayahuasca, and they preserve this memory of having been settled uh, in the Amazon a very long time ago. And on the other side of the world, in, in Egypt, there's a very similar story uh, in the Edfu building texts which also speak of that which speak specifically of the destruction of a former civilization uh, of its survivors and of how they tried to restart the civilization by wandering the world and bringing their ideas to many different cultures around the world hmm. i mean it's it's fascinating that there's this such a huge tie in to this sacred tea that I mean, and and also that you know, so much of this history has been erased. It's it's as if you know, there's there's some sort of I don't know. I hate to point in the direction of some large, massive conspiracy, but maybe even a cover up of you know what's really truly going on. Because it seems as if these ancient civilizations that were probably as advanced, if not more advanced than we are today, they were pointing at some macrocosmic perspective of the journey of the soul. What's happening? here in the human experience as we sort of evolve and grow? 
Very, very much so. You know, I mean, what is the what is the purpose of of of, of life? Is there a purpose at all? Uh, the, the the many mainstream scientists who are very much of the materialist frame of mind and who seek to reduce everything to matter, uh, who even regard consciousness as quote unquote an epiphenomenon of brain activity. In other words, that there's a materialist base to consciousness. Uh, individuals like that, for example, Professor Richard Dawkins, who's the author of The Selfish Gene and of, of, and of The God Delusion, uh, they will seek to persuade us that there is no meaning or purpose to human life at all, that we are simply accidents of biology uh, and chemistry, uh, that it's entirely random and that there's no that there's no purpose whatsoever and you know they could be right i i can't prove them wrong but my strong gut instinct and the legacy that we've received from many ancient civilizations see like the ancient egyptians they they put their best minds to work for thousands of years on what happens to us when we die our our civilization tries to avoid that richard dawkins and his like will tell you that nothing happens to us when we die we're just gone and that's the end of their story but the vast testimony of the ancient world is that we are in we are souls incarnated in these material bodies and that we're here to learn and to grow and to develop if that's the case then our mission here on earth is not simply to accumulate material goods mm. not simply to increase our wealth uh, not simply to compete with and and uh, outcompete others uh, not to define ourselves in terms of what we own uh, but to define ourselves in terms of who we are and of what we do with this life and with this what is regarded in the by the ancients as this incredible opportunity to have been born in a human body there are certain experiences at this level of vibration that can only be had at this level of vibration where there are direct physical consequences and once you start taking all of this on board and and open yourself to the possibility that our life on earth may be a theater of experience, that our particular purpose here is to learn and to grow and to develop and to manifest love rather than hatred and fear and suspicion. Then you begin to realize that the whole ethic of the modern world may be misleading us, may be taking us down a track that isn't helpful to us, uh, that Professor Richard Dawkins, when the time comes, uh, may find himself confronted by an extraordinary mystery that he's completely unprepared for because his whole life experience has persuaded him that there's no meaning to life, may suddenly find himself having to account for every second of the life that he has, mm. that he has lived. If that were the case, and the testimony of the ancients is that it is the case, then perhaps we would be living life in a different way on this planet. We would not be defining our worth in terms of our economic value, uh, in terms of how much we earn or what kind of motor car we own or what sort of washing machine we own. The, 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 the tendency of the modern world is to, to persuade us to define ourselves purely in those material terms. Uh, if there's so much more to life than that, if, if we're really here to learn and to grow and develop, then those material things, well, they have their place. But fundamentally, if we focus too much upon them, they're going to get in the way of our journey and they're going to prevent us from doing what we came here to do so that we have to keep on coming back and doing it again and again and again until we get the lesson. And that's where you, where you begin to realize that ancient teachings such as Gnosticism, which, which argue that, uh, that there are entities on this planet that the whole purpose of which is to mislead us and to divert us from our true course. The Gnostics called them the Archons, mm -hmm. uh, who serve the Demiurge, whose, whose, whose project is to snuff out the divine spark in, in humanity. You begin to realize that that may be, may be possible. And when we look around the modern world, we can see those Archons at work, and we can see them at work in the advertising industry, seeking to persuade us that the whole purpose of our lives is how much material stuff we can accumulate and, and seeking us to, to, to persuade us to congratulate ourselves because we have more material stuff than our neighbor. What a trivial 
little waste of the glorious experience of life on this majestic, beautiful garden of a planet. What a waste. We are being seduced into wasting the opportunities we've been given. And the ancients would say we are being seduced by negative entities such as the archons who are jealous of the divine spark within us and wish to shut it down. And my goodness, unfortunately, they're doing a very good job. But on the other side, they are shutting down the divine spark in humanity. You see it happening all around the world. The mainstream religions are implicated in this as well. It's not just commerce. But on the other side of the story, you have an awakening. And I'm aware of this awakening taking place, particularly amongst the younger generation, who I have the privilege of meeting very often at the events and talks that I give, an awakening, a refusal to put up with the bullshit any longer, a refusal to accept voices of authority that tell us what to think, and a willingness to think for ourselves. This is growing in the world. It's a small flame right now. And the archons, the archonic forces are seeking in every possible way to shut it down. But people are waking up. They are resisting this. And at the leading edge of this resistance, uh, and again, the mainstream would seek to present this as trivial, whereas in fact, it's incredibly important. At the leading edge of this resistance is our relationship with plants that alter consciousness, you know, with plants and fungi that alter consciousness. For for too long, we just bought into the mainstream narrative that these teacher plants are negative and unhelpful. But people are finding out for themselves that ayahuasca, psilocybin, peyote, San Pedro, and other, other teacher plants and fungi are incredibly positive and very helpful for our personal development. And that's why I celebrate what's happening in America where there has been this overarching governmental control of the war on drugs and which young people in state after state are rejecting and turning over and saying we will not accept what these authority, the false lies that these authority figures give to us. We will not accept them any longer. And the latest development of that is the decriminalization of psilocybin in Denver, which resulted from from a citizen's initiative. Uh, I, I, it, it's encouraging to me uh, when I see uh, citizens taking power into their own hands and refusing to be told what to think and what to do with their own bodies and with their own consciousness by some you know, fucking governmental authority. They have no right to tell us what to think and what to do with our own bodies and our own consciousness. And that, that's a reassertion of individual sovereignty over consciousness is a very healthy development. We're seeing it happening state by state in America with the, the, the growing legalization movement for, for, for cannabis. All of the arguments for making cannabis illegal are based on lies and falsehoods that were deliberately spread to mislead the population. And I'm encouraged in America that step by step, uh, state by state, People are taking the matter into their own hands, sticking one finger up to government and saying what we do with our bodies and our consciousness while we do no harm to others is entirely our business. This is a hugely important development in the human story. And I'm pleased that the people of America are at the spearhead of this change, even though the government, the federal government of America is still trying to keep it suppressed. Mm. So so profound, Graham. I mean, you're such a wonderful guest to have on because we touch on so much of this, and it's it's so profound to hear you speak because it's it's poetic the way you put this. I mean, there's nothing better than a Graham Hancock rant. It's perfect. Um, <laughs> Sorry, you got me into rant mode again. <laughs> yes, and and Graham, I mean, we want you to be healthy. We want you to take care of yourself. So you know where. So where are you now? You're in Chicago, and. Mm-hmm. Chicago, looking out at a sunny day uh, in in Chicago, flying to uh, flying to Phoenix tomorrow for a series of events that I have in Sedona. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm giving a big talk in Sedona on the 16th uh, about uh, America. Before uh, the details are up on my website, GrahamHancock.com. Um, go to the talks and events page and you'll see all my events, both the ones that I've now completed in North America and the ones that still remain. 
after Sedona, we're going to go to uh, a very amazing place in Utah, uh, Boulder, Utah, not Boulder, Colorado, but Boulder, Utah, uh, where I'm going to be giving a, 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 a seminar, a discussion with quite a small group of people, uh, and then onwards from there to Massachusetts. I'm doing an event up in uh, Massachusetts. I'm then going to be doing a couple of events in New York, and then finally back to uh, back to the West Coast, and and uh, before returning to England on I think the fourth of June. So all the details are up there on the talks and events page of my website, and I hope people will will join. I've had I've had some amazing events in America, great audiences, wonderful questions, and 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 a lot of love and support, which makes me which makes me feel very grateful um, because I have been a controversial figure. I have taken a lot of flack uh, from the archaeologists and their buddies in the media. Uh, but uh, I'm also aware that I am given a lot of love and a lot of support by my readers. And I'm enormously grateful for that. And I need to say this, as a writer, I would be nowhere without my readers. Writing has no impact unless it's read and unless those readers then take the ideas out there and work with them themselves and do their own thing with them. And I'm pleased to say that seems to be what's happening with my work. And I, I'm just grateful gratitude to my readers. Indeed, indeed. And I mean, I think you mentioned, I'm wrapping this up, but in, I think you mentioned that uh, some of your like after after lecture signings are taking up to seven hours and you stay with your readers to make sure that every single one of them gets a chance to you know get your signature, maybe even shake your hand. Absolutely, shake my hand and 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 take and take photographs. I, I I still don't understand why anybody would want to take a photograph with this old man, but I'm very willing to stand up and take photographs. This is my opportunity to give back. I owe everything to my readers. I will never leave an event until the last of my of, of my readers and the last of those attending the event have left. I will always stay there. It's run me down. I've got I've got very exhausted mm. physically. It's very demanding, but emotionally, it's very satisfying to be able to. It makes it real for me to talk sure. to talk to those who read my work, to spend time with them, to honor them, and to respect them. And and I commit to always doing that because I always have to keep this in perspective. I'm just a writer. The writing doesn't matter unless it's read and unless those readers then take action and talk to others uh, about what they've, what they've read in my books. Uh, I owe everything to my readers and, and I want to give back and that's what I'm here to do. Indeed, indeed, my friend. Thank you so much, Graham. The, guys, the book is called America Before. Graham Hancock is my guest. Uh, America Before, The Key to Earth's Lost Civilization. It's on shelves. You can go and get the book. I highly recommend this. I recommend reading it more than once. There's a lot of information here. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe. Share the show with your friends. If you're listening to it on YouTube, you can subscribe and get notifications when we go live. If you really like this show, buy us a coffee. That would be great. Um, otherwise, Graham, any closing statements here, man? I think I think the on the only closing statement I have is to say this life is a mystery. We are immersed in a mystery. We live in an enchanted realm. Let's remember that the enchantment and the mystery and the magic that's what it's all about. It's not about material possessions and wealth and power. It's about recognizing the magic of being alive at all and of having this opportunity to live however many years we're given in a human body with the capacity to learn and to grow and to develop. Indeed. Graham, thank you so much, so much for your time, my friend. Guys, we're going to get out of here. You, we're back on Thursday this week with our guest, Kostas Danzos. And... Here we go. See you later this week.